Hello, welcome everyone. Let me just take this mask off. <clears throat> Thanks so much for coming, both in person and to those uh, near and far on our live stream on Facebook Live. Thanks too to all our sponsors for making tonight possible. We're going to start things off by honoring and acknowledging that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, and Pekani, the Sitsina, the Stony Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all of the people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of southern Alberta. We also acknowledge our immediate proximity to the Bow River, a site that resonates with all of us today and with indigenous populations for thousands of years. Next, a little bit of housekeeping. It is great to have people here tonight. Uh, it's uh, funny times out there in the world and <laughs> things uh, seem to be ramping up again, but that's a good reminder to be really COVID aware. So let's make sure that we're all in our cohort or at least three seats apart from someone who isn't. Uh, please wear your masks and uh, a, a little, just so you know that bathrooms are located to the right of the auditorium doors just out there. Uh, I'd also remind you that after the talk, we're gonna be doing a Q&A and our good friend David here has a, a microphone that he will bring to you and will disinfect between each question that you might have. So, we're very pleased to uh, present this artist talk with one of our nation's most celebrated artists, Adrian Stimson. Adrian is a member of the Siksika Nation. He has a BFA from the University of Alberta, for, or sorry, Alberta University for the Arts, and an MFA from the University of Saskatchewan. <laughs> Not used to that, ACAD, okay. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Adrian's work spans performance, painting, sculpture, photography, and more, often with his trademark wit, but always with a critical and poignant eye. He exhibits nationally and internationally. He was awarded the Governor General Award for Visual and Media Arts in 2018, the Reveal Indigenous Arts Awards in 2017, the Blackfoot Visual Arts Award in 2009, the Alberta Centennial Medal in 2005, and the Queen Elizabeth II Golden Jubilee Medal in 2003. <laughs> I think we can all see why he is acclaimed. Uh, incredible. So this talk is part of our public programming around the exhibition Growing Freedom, which itself has two parts, the instructions of Yoko Ono and the art of John and Yoko. We're thrilled to offer these, whoops, I'm changing slides. <laughs> We're thrilled to offer these exhibitions to our Calgary community. Tonight's presentation is possible because Adrian kindly agreed to collaborate with Yoko Ono on our new iteration of Water Event, along with Faye Heavy Shield, Seth Cardinal Dodging Horse, Jesse Short, Judy Anderson, and Kablusiak. A little background on Water Event. In 1971, as part of her first museum exhibition, This Is Not Here, Yoko invited people to produce a water sculpture that she would work on as well, establishing a unity between artists. The piece was titled Water Event. And in that very first iteration, she had invited 120 participants, including the likes of Andy Warhol, Richard Hamilton, George Machunas, and many, many, many more. So pretty good company. Yoko has said of Water Event, it was a Zen joke, I thought. Jokes and laughter are very important elements in Zen. <clears throat> this particular joke is that I get all the containers from the artist to fill them with water, and the water I supply is conceptual, meaning I never fill them with actual water. I liked that bit. It gave me a laugh right away, as soon as I thought of the idea, and that's when I knew it was a good piece. I think uh, Adrian can relate to that sort of wit and humor. <laughs> When we were tasked with inviting a new group of artists for this current iteration of Water Event, we immediately knew that it should reflect the enormous significance water has played in our community. And when you consider the long history and impact of the Bow and Elbow Rivers to the indigenous populations, past and present, it seemed the best thing would be to invite artists for whom that connection would resonate in their collaboration with Yoko. Again, it made great sense to invite Adrian Stimson. So before I bring you up, I'll just end with some words of Yoko from her 1967 piece called Water Talk. You are water. I'm water. We're all water in different containers. That's why it's so easy to meet. And someday, we'll evaporate together. But even after the water's gone, we'll probably point out to the containers and say, that's me there, that one. We're container minders. Thank you.
Adrian Stinson. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. First of all, welcome to my uh, COVID hair. <laughs> it's like, wow, it's just suddenly I have hair, and it's a whole new, a whole new performance tool. <laughs> First off, uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you, Ryan, for your kind words and uh, warm welcoming uh, to uh, Calgary Contemporary. Uh, it's uh, an absolute honor to be here this evening, and also thank you to your staff. Uh, who have helped to uh, arrange this event and to keep us all safe. Um, for those who can't see, we have a limited audience here, and uh, because I have my own little bubble up here, I can take my mask off uh, for the talk. Um, and I'd also like to thank Yoko Ono. Uh, she uh, present, or you presented us with a lovely note that she had sent to us, uh, excited and thanking us to be a part of this event. I, in turn, uh, would like to thank her. Uh, I, have, I have been a fan of hers for many years and admired her work, especially in performance. And uh, to be uh, asked to collaborate with her was a little bit surreal, uh, uh, but uh, very exciting nonetheless. So to Yoko Ono, thank you so much. And I do hope that someday we may be able to meet. Uh, so that was just so wonderful to be a part of this, along with my uh, fellow artists. OK. I haven't given an artist talk since probably January. It all feels so brand new. <laughs> it's like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> so here we go. Uh, what I thought I would do is just give a bit of context to, uh, context to my practice uh, and uh, sort of end up with uh, Water Event and the work I created for this. Okinuksukwa, Nestudi Daniku, Apoyiskumapi, Exukuawata. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, all my relations. Uh, my name is in Blackfoot, Little Brown Boy. Uh, my English name is uh, Adrian Stimson. Adrian from a nun, Sister Adrian. And Stimson, I believe, from the big rancher down here in southern Alberta, Fred Stimson, who ran Bar U Ranch. I'm still doing research on that one. Uh, I received my BFA from uh, the then Alberta a College of Art and Design, and now Alberta University for the Arts, for which I am very proud to be an alumnus, or alumni. And uh, then I got my master's at the University of Saskatchewan uh, in Saskatoon, and also very honored to be a part of that uh, institution, alumnus. Um, I was started off as a painter. Uh, painting is actually my first love. Uh, that's what I majored in uh, in my undergrad. And I started to use the icon uh, or the symbol of the bison. Uh, for those who are aware, uh, the bison were plentiful on the plains at one point, 75 million it's estimated. In a very short time of the slaughter, they almost went extinct. The bison to the Blackfoot people were everything. They were our source of food, our source of tools, our source of shelter our source of uh, spirit, uh, most of all, mostly our spiritual life. So they were everything. And you can imagine with the slaughter of them uh, how greatly that impacted us. And that impact still resonates today. However, uh, once while I was at, at the university, I was also studying physics. And uh, both Blackfoot physics and the new physics. And when we really look at all of us, we're all just made up of atoms. We're all just particles. And we're held together in all these different vehicles. And it goes very well with indigenous um, knowledge systems that everything has a spirit to it. And everything is, can be animated from the rock to the tree to myself. And I think new physics and science in some ways is proving this true. So for me, that sense that at that time of the slaughter, uh, that energy of those 75 million bison went into the universe. And I believe that it still exists in and around us. So I get the great pleasure privilege as an artist to sort of reach into that ether, grab that energy, bring it into myself, and create the work I create. And on occasion, sell that work. And that feeds me. So in essence, the bison, like my ancestors, is still feeding me today. So it's a continuum. And it's a way that I view the world that gives me great solace. And also with the fact that the bison is making a return. It's incredibly resilient. 
and it is making a return. And I had a bison manifesto many years ago, and it was that, that the bison should repopulate the plains, and we should actually get out of their way <laughs> and let them do what they want. Maybe that will happen. So this particular painting was one of the first sort of paintings I started to do and sort of looking at the idea of bison particles. So I started playing with that. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my uh, grandparents, the first Adrian Stimson and my grandmother, uh, Peggy Bearchief. I am part of the Bearchief, Heavy Shield, and Olson clans, Olson being a grandfather of mine. And so this is called Past, Present, Future. There's another painting that accompanies it, which is just the design of the teepee, which is a, a teepee I designed uh, uh, out of a vision I had of bison particles. And so that teepee exists in the world now, and I kind of look at this idea that the past, present, future is all in one. And it works well with Blackfoot ideas of time that really we only have two days behind us and two days ahead of us. That all the past and the future and the present are really very close to each other, closer than we think. So I always feel very important to, uh, to mention my, my family. Uh, some of my first paintings started dealing with uh, the history of the genocide in the Americas, uh, in particular residential schools. And for me and my family, it has impacted greatly. The majority of my family, my father, all went to residential school. And I myself went to residential day school. This particular work is called Wake Up, and it was based on photographs I took of the Paul Little Walker Cemetery, for which most of my relations are buried, and in the background, the back of Olson uh, Residential School, which is now a college, uh, but it was uh, uh, the school where most of my family went to. I often speak in terms of the bison, uh, and this particular one is called Tartan Feathered Bison. Uh, my early works, I was using tar, and I was feathering, and the practice of tar and feathering as a punishment in the sense of the bison, and also tar being a derivative uh, of smoke and also the oil industry. So there are also underlying um, meanings to my work. I often think of my work as an archeological dig. You see what you see on the surface, but as you start going deeper, you start seeing different meanings and layers uh, to, why, to what I'm doing. I also have sort of a more romanticized notions of bison in the, uh, in the um, uh, winterscape or in the landscape. Uh, this was a whole series called Bison Heart. And uh, it's all, I, I have the tendency and the love of painting with white titanium oil and black graphite powder, for which I like to mix up the powder with the oil and I make the different values and, and, and play with it that way. But this was a, sort of the first works I really started to develop, delve into in, in relation to sort of the icon or the bison on the plains. And then it's starting to actually evolve and you'll see as you go along. Again, uh, starting to sort of pull apart the bison and just play with the idea of painting, the painterly aspects and just being a painter. So while it still has sort of the form, I believe it's starting to, at some point, well, later, sorry. <laughs> you'll see what I'm doing. Uh, and then I started to add in the background uh, industry. For this one here has a pipeline in the very background. You can't really see it, but it's there. Uh, and also looking at the idea, especially on the plains and how resource extraction is part of the colonial project and part of the eco side uh, of the land. And so I've been thinking a lot about that lately. Uh, this particular painting is part of that series, a little bison and a pump jack in the background. This was purchased by the British Museum and is now part of their collection. Uh, as uh, well as this painting here was gifted to them as well. So they have two of my paintings that will eventually end up in their North American Indigenous collection after they renovate. It's in storage right now, so you can't see it. Somebody actually emailed me and said, I don't see your painting anywhere in the British Museum. <laughs> I said, it's in storage. <laughs> so hopefully one day. Uh, and again, just I'm just sort of going through some of the paintings and you see how I'm starting to just sort of pull it apart and play with the form and line and, and such. Uh, often include um, the uh, skulls of bison in my work, and you'll see the red line. You saw that red line in Wake Up, and that was the first time I started to put the red line in my work. And the red line to me is like, you know, crossing the line, you know, making the line, you don't pass that line. So it becomes this sort of metaphor uh, for this sort of division that, uh, that, that, that is happening in our society on many levels. 
And this one is uh, postmodern bison, which is in the collection of the Glenbow Museum. And it was the first uh, piece I worked with hide, bison hide. Uh, just down the hill from ACAD at that time was Halford Hides. One day I went down there, managed to get the money together, bought a hide and went back up to the college. It was on my shoulder. I walked up the hill. And as I'm walking up there, I'm thinking, Oh man, it's just like, could you imagine? It's just like just the past. <laughs> me walking around with a bison hide is very ironic and kind of funny in so many ways to me. But anyway, I put it on a stretcher canvas and I call it a painting. And uh, it's displayed on, on, uh, at different times. For those who, I'm sorry, the quality of this particular image is not that great. But uh, for those who know my performance uh, work will know my alter ego, Buffalo Boy. And Buffalo Boy is a character parody of Buffalo Bill in his Wild West shows and the spectacle of those shows through time. The exclusion and the inclusion of indigenous people, uh, including Sitting Bull. Um, and really, it's just sort of uh, looking at sort of a, a more, I also infuse the idea of two-spiritedness within Buffalo Boy and a lot of mischief. And so Buffalo Boy tend is, tended to talk back to the colonial project. And this was a performance in Kingston where everybody in the audience, I created Sir John A. Macdonald masks. So I was completely surrounded by Sir John A. Macdonald in that particular one. And that one was called Buffalo Boys, I Hear the Train A-Coming. And, <laughs> and so it was, it was based on, uh, on the, I think at that time it was the 200 years of uh, Sir John A. or something. I just recently heard his head rolled I don't, know, I don't know what that's, I, have, I think I saw a few images of that. Again, the bison, the history of the bison, uh, the slaughter of the bison, an image from that particular one I had a very svelte uh, server, served me a, a McDonald's hamburger. But we really was looking at the fact that the bison were exterminated to clear the plains for agriculture and stuff. And ironically, in that process, in killing the animals, starved out the indigenous people. And there's a famous image, I believe, of Little Bear uh, starving uh, in Saskatchewan. And I ended my performance with reenacting uh, that particular pose. The uh, other images are just Buffalo Boy here and there. Here he is in Banff hanging around um, in the uh, parks. One of the more iconic images of Buffalo Boy out at Burning Man, which was a big part of Buffalo Boy's history and life. Uh, Buffalo Boy up at Prince Albert National Park, for which there is a herd of 300 bison. And I always give gratitude to the bison stewards up there. There's a whole group of people who basically keep the bison in the park and protect them because they like, you know, as bison do, roam and uh, often go into the farmer's fields and stuff, so they often crowd back into the park. But it is the last, one of the last, uh, purely genetic uh, plains bison herds in North America. So it needs to be protected. Uh, Buffalo Boy begat the shaman exterminator. And the shaman exterminator sort of uh, is a little bit more sort of mysterious and sort of uh, uh, often comments on sort of appropriation and new age spiritualism and, and such in sort of a campy, funny way. I often employ humor in my work. Uh, for me, humor has a number of meanings. Uh, I think humor in many ways is a survival mechanism. Uh, I think it, uh, I know for certain that laughter is often heard on my First Nation and uh, because humor and, and comedy is often mixed in our language and, and such. So again, it's all these different things. But I often sort of I like this idea of the sort of the, uh, the tickle and the slap method. <laughs> you tickle them first and then you slap them, and then you hug them. <laughs> but you know, we have hard histories, and those hard histories at times are very hard to deal with. And I realize that, not only for myself, but for everyone. And it's really important, I think, to, in a way, to open up a dialogue. We have to talk. Because if we don't talk, we know the alternative is much worse. And I fear that we are getting into a time now where that's happening again. We, in our society, are becoming further and further divided. And part of that is not only the lack of talking to each other, but believing in things that aren't true. <laughs> so I think it's very important that we start thinking about those things more as we move forward into the future. Uh, again, Shaman Exterminator at Burning Man, Shaman Exterminator dancing around, and then Buffalo Boy getting it from four directions. It's a <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a little irreverent, even within my own cultural <laughs> world. Uh, you know, when I think about the, when I thought about this particular one as a poster, um, it was that sense of being that sometimes, uh, not sometimes, a lot of the times as an indigenous person, it always feels like everything's coming from four directions, uh, good and bad. So I was sort of playing with this idea. And then uh, Buffalo Boy actually was the original Miss Chief. <laughs> I would like to just sort of say that. Because <laughs> you know there are other Miss Chiefs out there. Anyway, <laughs> so this was the original Miss Chief, uh, and I have the proof of it. Uh, I think uh, I also, one of the other things that I think is so important is the archive. And the Glenbow has a fantastic archive, archive of uh, Blackfoot material culture and photographic history. So what I started to do is bump historical images to uh, Buffalo Boy images. And this particular one, up in the corner there, do you see the, uh, the priest with the uh, beard and glasses? That, keep that in mind, that is the Reverend Timms. The Reverend Timms, and that will become a little bit re more relevant as I, I go on a little further. And then the sort of work at that one. Sketches of Indian life was in my Irish grandmother's uh, china cabinet. And if you read through it, it's the most racist book in the world. <laughs> my poor granny. <laughs> Uh, this one was at a RCMP camp at a Sundance. And that bottle in the middle, interestingly enough, is a gin bottle. I found out it was a gin bottle. So Blackfoot people are serving RCMP gin at a Sundance. <laughs> if that isn't funny, I don't know what is. Um, <laughs> to me, anyway. Uh, but again, it's like it's these weird sort of dichotomies. And who knows, maybe it is something else, but we're not sure. So again, the play on that. And that's my husband, Happy playing the RCMP with a big bottle with a red heart on it. Uh, this is the first Anglican. Uh, the Sixth Nation uh, basically was split in half. The West, uh, the East went to the uh, Catholics. The West went to the Anglicans. My family was all in the West. Olson was the name of the uh, school was done there. And the first missionary to go there was the Reverend Timms. And that's him a bit older uh, in the back there with the beard kind of half in face there. And again, that's the Reverend Timms. There we go. Not a little parody of that. Uh, and then this was um, the shaman exterminator on the trail of the Woodcraft Indians with the Buffalo Boy Scouts of America. And I love long titles. And this was based on my re research around the Woodcraft Indians, which was pre um, predated the Boy Scouts, and in fact was the model for the Boy Scouts, and I did a lot of research of the history of that, and, um, and which actually started in Canada, in, um, just in Car Carberry, Manitoba, interestingly, near the Spirit Sands, and that's how I started to tune into this. So, of course, Buffalo Boy has to do his own, oh, his own um, what is that called, a, uh, a creed? A what? No, it, yeah, it's a, when you know when you make a pledge or something like that, yeah, pledge. Okay, so that's that. And then, of course, all, I mapped and looked at the whole history of dressing up as Indian, in quotation marks. And very interesting, because there's a lot of buy-ins. It started with the word craft. Uh, there's Carl May in, England, or in uh, Berlin in Germany. Uh, then it goes into books and literature. Then it goes into Hollywood. And then it goes into uh, advertising and you name it, and then costumes and such. So it was quite the exploration of coming to know the history of dressing up as, uh, as, as Indian. And I do that in quotations. Uh, this was Brave Seduction, again, looking at the history of how Hollywood's complicity in creating the stereotype of indigenous people, in particular Plains tribes. And so for this particular performance, I was completely covered in red, um, red paint, came out, emerged from a um, buffalo robe uh, in a loincloth. I wiped off all the red in the background. There I am in my traditional Blackfoot uh, buckskin outfit. And then I bet there was, uh, in the last one, you'll see that little thing there, that's 40 pounds of lard. So after I washed all the red off and disrobed, I completely covered myself uh, in uh, lard. And then a friend came up afterwards and threw feathers on me. So I was lard and feathered. And man, I had the best, softest skin for about a week. And, uh, but again, looking at that history of, uh, of identity construction and uh, how my identity has been constructed by someone else. 
and how now in our time we get to correct that and work through that. Another little performance I did was the uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken Dance. And uh, I, for those who, who may know, for some reason, Kentucky Fried Chicken is the absolute delicacy of, I know, my, of, of six of God. <laughs> Everybody used to go to Kentucky Fried Chicken, always, always, always. And as we know, the replacement of uh, fast food to good food, including bison, has caused a real epidemic of uh, diabetes, obesity, you name it. And so for me, what I did is I actually got an outfit uh, of the colonels. I painted my face like the colonel. I had a, a roach and I made my own bustle. I actually learned how to do a chicken dance because the chicken dance originates with us Blackfoot, or the prairie chicken dance. And uh, basically did the dance. I came out with a bucket of uh, about 20 pieces of chicken. I did the dance and I sat down and within three minutes consumed a whole bucket. It actually taught me never to eat Kentucky Tried Chicken again. <laughs> And always as a caveat, be careful as a performance artist. Uh, always do your research, never harm yourself. I want to say that, because that's also important. Uh, I am a able seaman with the Canadian military. I took part in the Canadian Forces Artist Program, which took me to Afghanistan. And so I was at Kandahar and Masamgar, and here this image was in Masamgar. Um, and I was there for a period of time. Here I am as an able seaman at CFB Esquimalt in uh, Bank or Victoria. My, it just actually proves that I was in there. <laughs> so these images are just from uh, Masamgar in uh, Kanda uh, in, um, in Afghanistan. It was a most uh, sobering, uh, incredible experience uh, that I had. And I created uh, two, I created an exhibition called Holding Our Breath. And it was uh, just basically a multi disciplinary uh, exhibition of video, paintings, uh, photography, installations that basically looked at my experience uh, uh, being in Afghanistan. Uh, this is when we were in the Chinook helicopter returning back to uh, Kandahar. And then just a few images of work that I created. Uh, this uh, exhibition uh, toured across uh, Canada. And then I joined forces with Christine Connolly and uh, she created terms of engagement uh, with Dick Abrams and Nicola Feldman Kiss that was at uh, Esker Foundation a few years back. So this is a bomb dog and an Apache helicopter. And again, the names of a lot of the equipment and such in the military and even code stuff are all on indigenous uh, words like Apache, Chinook, um, bison uh, carriers, you name it. It's very interesting. Uh, that's a whole other line of investigation. It's the wonderful thing about being an artist. You start investigating in certain topics and it takes you in all these incredible directions. I, I love that aspect of, 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 of being an artist and, and my practice. Here's uh, again a couple of portraits of uh, First Nation soldiers I met while I was there, a installation sandbox and the large scale chalk drawings uh, that I did on the wall. Well, actually these were done on paper, uh, but uh, the Esker allowed me to actually do it right on their wall, so I love that. <laughs> Again, the slaughter of the bison and one of the most iconic in images I've found of the pile of bones. This is actually, I thought was in Regina, but I'm now learning that it was from the United States. And again, how, how research evolves. You think something is from somewhere, and then all of a sudden, years later, you find out, no, actually, it was from, from someplace else. So it's an image now that I get to correct, in the sense, and I believe, uh, oh, of course, I'm going to forget northern US. <laughs> and so this one led me into Beyond Redemption. And uh, this is the installation I created of a taxidermied bison with 10 uh, bison robes that surrounded it. In, under the bison robes are black crosses, the internalization and the complicity of religion within the colonial project uh, throughout history. Uh, this particular work is now in the collection of the Musée de Beaux-Arts in Montreal. Uh, this was one of uh, my uh, uh, master's works, and it was called Sick and Tired. Uh, many years ago, as they, as they were renovating Old Sun, uh, now college, um, for some reason I went to the dump and got all the windows and beds and dragged it all home and stuff, st stuck it in my parents' garage, you know, thinking I was going to do something with it years later. And that was like in the, in the uh, early, late 80s, early 90s. It wasn't until I became an artist that actually all this material culture suddenly seemed very relevant to me, and I started creating these installations. 
as a bison robe in a human form on top, lit from atop and below, so the idea of the stretched hides. And I filled the, uh, the windows with feathers to sort of indicate that sense of smothering that those schools were, and I can imagine the children looking out. This is Old Sun, which still exists today. Uh, this one is aggressive, called Aggressive Simulation, My Father and Myself. Uh, the age of when I started going to residential school and, and I think the age when he started, he was at the end of his residential school experience and all of a sudden being a catalyst for all, for all of it. When my father passed, I donned his buckskin outfit and I sat in the halls of the University of Regina for uh, six hours for four days straight uh, during the day and did nothing. This was called silent witness. And I just sat there for six hours looking straight ahead and people would engage with me or not. And there were some really beautiful moments. There were some really sort of weird moments where people just didn't quite know what was going on. But it was an honor. It was in, in to honor him and honor uh, that history. Some of the odd little pieces of material culture. This is from Old Son. And this one always gets me because it's like a Christmas card. And suffer little children. Again from Old Son. I started doing paintings of, of taking the architecture of the call of those residential schools that I had, that I'm um, related to, that being Olson to start with, St. Uh, Paul's in uh, Kainai, um, uh, Shinwak in Sault Ste. Marie, where my father met my mother and where I was most likely conceived in a residential school. And uh, then <laughs> my mother doesn't like me telling that story. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and then we went up north to uh, Fort George, uh, to St. Philip's uh, Residential School, and then to Saskatchewan, uh, to uh, Gordon's Residential School, where I started attending residential school, and then ended in Labrette. Uh, so there are six of these paintings. I'm only showing one here of Olson. Uh, this one was a performance I did uh, honoring Ahasu Muskegon Isku uh, and his performance in the early 90s. He was at the vanguard of indigenous performance. Uh, he did a performance, uh, part, part of it was called White Shame. It was a durational performance. And at one point in that performance, he pierced himself seven times on his chest uh, with feathers. We were asked by the Grunt, Grunt Gallery in Vancouver and uh, Vivo, Vivo uh, to look at his history and react and create a performance. So I did uh, White Shame re reworked. And this was a performance uh, where I uh, pierced myself seven times during the performance, and those are eagle feathers on me. I also collaborate with, in particular, Laurie Blondeau, the lovely Laurie Blondeau. And uh, we originally started with uh, Belle Sauvage, her persona, and my persona, Buffalo Boy, putting the wild back into the West. And you have to, in context, this was in the early 2000s, when we first started this. The discussion around uh, dressing up as Indian, in quotation marks, um, was just really beginning. And the pushback in terms of dressing up, especially Halloween, all those things. So we were actually bringing attention to that through these performance, because we were dressing up everybody as Indian. And we would take these sort of uh, period type photographs with it. So now there exists a great archive of these images uh, that we have. And we haven't quite figured out what we're going to do with it yet. Uh, but it was a great uh, performance that actually went across the country. Uh, we've retired it. We will no longer do it. Uh, time, things change through time and shift through time. And today to do it would not seem right. <laughs> this was in Lethbridge. And this was uh, her other character, uh, Betty Daybird. And this is a new character I cr created called Mister. And I can't remember what we're doing, but those are assless chaps. And I just remember walking into the um, uh, Art Gallery of Southern Alberta. Sag. <laughs> I get these names wrong. Sorry, everybody. And, uh, and uh, Leroy Little Bear and, and, and Amethyst were there. <laughs> they came up, and they're my elders. <laughs> I think they, they took one look and kind of left <laughs> with, a, with a big smirk and laugh on their, on their, on their faces. Uh, this one was another one we did at Lethbridge again. Interesting. A lot of our political work happened in Lethbridge. Uh, Canadian Idol No More. Idol no more. The uh, sort of fusion of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Idol series and the Idol No More. And this is where we were looking at those ideas of rule of law. And uh, so Laurie and I became judges, and we were to judge the most racist uh, Canadian. And <laughs> we had a huge online nomination process. 
and then the audience determined who uh, was the most racist, and uh, then we read the verdict at the performance at the end after we had completed. Again, identity construction. Um, uh, this was taken in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, I turned a corner and there was this whole shop uh, to indigenous uh, North America, uh, completely filled with a kitsch all made in, in, in China, and uh, postcards with my own relatives on all these postcards. I was just thinking, man, I could get royalties for these sort of things. But again, the idea of the construction of the of, um, uh, Sitting Bull, uh, then of course the iconic uh, cigar store Indian that's in front of many stores, and then the real Indian. So you get a real thing. But Barcelona, of course, being the place of where Christopher Columbus uh, headed off into the Americas, uh, this is a particular steps which the decrees were made. I found those steps and went and st stood on those. And then at uh, the end of Las Ramblas in, in Barcelona is the iconic monument to Christopher Columba, Columbus pointing uh, uh, westward. And so I think like all performance artists, I thought this was a great opportunity to do a little guerrilla performance. And so I had pointing back at Columbus. <laughs> um, I, a few years back, got into public sculpture. And this was a sculpture I created with my uh, husband, Happy, and uh, Jean-Sebastien Gauthier. And uh, we, were, um, we won the competition, uh, the um, uh, White Cap uh, Dakota First Nation, uh, which is just uh, south of Saskatoon, commissioned this work. And it was to the War of 1812. That was when they were doing a lot of monuments across Canada to the War of 1812 and for which very little recognition is, is ever given to the indigenous uh, participation and, and the fact that had indigenous people from uh, not uh, sided with the crown, um, that war perhaps would be, have gone a very different way. So this was a great opportunity to look at uh, the figures in their history and in their, in their culture uh, who played a part in that. This is the medicine line. The medicine line to the Dakota is the border between Canada and U US and we put a whole bunch of petroglyphs uh, in that line that spoke to the entire history of the White Cap Dakota First Nation. It's another issue there. The characters are Chief Wapasha, Colonel Robert Dixon, and Dixon married a, uh, a Dakota woman, uh, Totoin, and they had four children, and their youngest daughter in 1812 would have been Helen. So we had Totoin and uh, Helen witnessing uh, the exchange of uh, the King George medals uh, the the um, flags, yeah, King George generals and flags. <laughs> and I was just watching The Crown last night, and Edward was there. <laughs> and I was like, well, he was the nicest one of them all. <laughs> anyway, Prince Edward came to unveil it uh, at that time. Uh, this was a five-day durational performance from sunrise to sunset. I was approached by military museums, uh, Lindsay Sharman, and uh, curated, and I did a five-day durational performance, again, from sunrise to sunset. And looking at, uh, it was the anniversary of Vimy, Vimy Ridge, and during my research, the trenches, of course, became very relevant uh, to me. And so part of my thinking was, what would it be like to actually to build a trench? So I built a trench. And I actually did it in the Blackfoot symbols of the square U's, which are um, uh, symbols of, of war and conflict. Uh, within our petroglyphic uh, language. And uh, that still exists. And it's since become a gopher condo, a, con a coyote condo <laughs> at one time. And, uh, and I've actually seen deer on it from, at other times. So I'm actually watching it uh, decay. And um, interestingly enough, given our situation with COVID, this year's uh, Remembrance Day, I had, went up there and laid a poppy on the, uh, on the trench. I did a performance uh, as part of that, at the end of that, and a celebration. And this was just a stance very similar to one of the Vimy uh, uh, monuments uh, poses uh, in France. Uh, recently, I was uh, commissioned to do a work out at uh, 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 Trinity Developments, uh, Medicine Hill by Pascapoo Slopes there, and they wanted a bison. So I finally got to do a bronze bison. And so now that exists out uh, in that development as part of, uh, 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 it actually backs up into, into, the, into the parking lot, but the, the walkway up to it is beautiful gardens and stuff in between two, two condo developments. So 
yay, I got to great make a uh, monument. And the um, uh, plinth it st sits on is all um, uh, petroglyphic language, again, looking at different parts of history. So if you go through, you'll be able to look at those. And one of the interesting things I just discovered that way back when a comment went by, and I think everybody realize, remember the comment that just recently went by. Um, what was it called? Um, starts with a B. Anyway, I put a comment on there, and the comment always sort of signaled something to come. And look what we're in now. So I often think the prolific sort of histories that I come from is often included. And this is another sculpture I created uh, that will be in that development as well. It's just steel, all thing, but when you move in different directions, you'll see the bison. These are my work again, going back to the residential school. These are different paintings, much larger paintings uh, that I uh, examined each school that my family, uh, or that my father and then I attended and were at. So that was uh, Old Sun. This is St. Uh, Paul's. Shinwalk. That's uh, St. Mary's River. Um, uh, St. Philip's in Fort George, now, knows, now known as Chississippi. And uh, those two are basically um, silhouettes of um, Inuit uh, sculptures. And my very first toys were Inuit sculptures, were soapstones. So I remember playing with soapstones as a kid, which those two we still have in my family. Uh, this was uh, Gordon's residential school, the school that I first started attending, uh, residential school. And then the last one was Le Bret, is where I sort of ended. And I, I, I never really draw a buffalo boy in my paintings. I've never really included him in any of my paintings. I don't want to. But this was the first time I did. And the reason why I did was because at that time, I was uh, at those schools, uh, suffering from abuse that was going on in those schools. And one of the things I would do after school is I'd go home, and my personality kind of split. And I became Adrienne. And Adrienne donned a white pleather fringe jacket and would go out and play with the boys. So I believe, in my own mind, that's where Buffalo Boy actually began. So interestingly enough, I started thinking about that. And then the buffalo starting to block out the school itself in the sense that history and time is changing. And then this is a piece I call Just Get Over It. And as you see, the line is starting. And this is six uh, panels all together of bison. And as you see, the line is breaking up. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? There's this interesting thing, especially in our time with the rise of white supremacy and harkening back to the KKK, for which here in Canada, there's a huge history of the KKK being here as well. And sort of looking at this, are they going to cross that line? Are we going to come in? Are we in this period again where things are becoming so muddled and, and are we going to end up hating each other again? So, and then, I'll, uh, of course, that saying to, that I've heard many times myself, and many First Nations pe people here is, you know, just get over it. Get over the past. You know, we're here now, so that doesn't matter. You've got to move on. Move on. <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> so getting back to the Reverend Timms. Um, the Reverend Timms is the great-grandfather of A.A. A. Bronson. And A.A. A. Bronson is a member of General Idea. Um, and uh, I'm such a bad artist sometimes. Um, AA reached out to Candace Hopkins asking if she knew any, in particular, Siksika or Blackfoot artists that he could connect to. And so she said, yeah, connect with Adrian. Uh, and so he contacted me. And when he first contacted me, I was like, oh, who is this AA Bronson? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then all of a sudden, at some point, it, it dawned on me, oh, OK, general idea. But I didn't really know who he was to begin with. And he approached me and asked me and told me the story that his great-grandfather was the Reverend Timms, the first missionary on my First Nation. And the Reverend Timms was not a very nice man, very pious, very ultra-religious. And as the story goes, it's quite a long story, but uh, the short, short um, story is this is that he would take in the children. And then basically, once they were within the mission, he would not allow them to go home, of course. And at that time, uh, tuberculosis and other diseases were rampant. And the children were dying. And he would not allow those children to go home and die in the arms of their parents. And you can imagine the horror and the outrage that the parents had that he could not see their children as they were dying. 
Uh, so what happened was is that a number of uh, uh, parents from back home uh, went out, uh, warned. He was warned to get off the reserve because he was going to be killed. And so he fled the nation, and the mission and the school were burnt down. So that was called the Siksika Rebellion, that, which nobody ever really hears about. And uh, so uh, Reverend Tim's then, I think, believe, ended up in Sutana and sort of uh, continued his, his mission. Uh, but AA, for a very long time in his life, this has been a part of his life and his thinking. And he always wanted to make an apology on behalf of his family. So when it comes to apologies, I know it can be kind of skeptical and, and cynical when it comes to them, uh, because often when apologies are given, the walk that occurs afterwards doesn't necessarily match the apology, as we have well seen in many occasions uh, in Canada. But in order to make a, a proper apology, I think you have to need to ask somebody if you can apologize to them first. So AA actually really approached me in a, in a good way and us in a good way. And I consulted with elders. And basically, one elder says, you know, not too often that somebody comes to us to apologize. Maybe we should listen. And so what I, we listened. And uh, we built a relationship. And uh, he asked me if I would respond in some way. And so over the last number of years, we've been writing together. And this was uh, the result of the work uh, that, uh, that ended up in the uh, Toronto Biennale. And this is uh, a number of elements in installation. I created four large sculpt or three large sculptures, uh, one being the burning of, of the residential school, one being one I knew when I made of uh, Chief Olson, and that is the actual petroglyph uh, on winter counts of the first missionary, the Reverend Timms. So these are now uh, sculptures. Um, the table is Ini Iksuka Ini Sumapi, which is uh, Buffalo Boy and Blackfoot. And uh, this one's called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Uh, sort of thinking about that early film with Sidney Poitier. And uh, AA first came to the, my nation uh, a couple of years ago back in the winter. It was his first time to Sixtica. And as he recounts to me, he said he was terrified. <laughs> but I had arranged a dinner with a number of elders who had been to residential school at my home. And we sat down and we discussed apologies and what they meant or didn't, don't mean. And it was a really beautiful opportunity for us to share with him the hurt and the pain of history, but for him to also hear it firsthand and, and feel the account. And it really started dawning on me the importance of creating relationships, that these apologies are between people, between us as people. And this is how things are going to change. And that's the only way people are going to change. If we take the time and take the effort to get to know each other, spend time with each other, and understand each other, and as I'm sure Yoko Ono would say, love each other. Uh, this is the table itself, and I had 10 little bronze bison that sits on a very well-appointed silver uh, uh, charger and plates. And, uh, and in the background is actually a, a recreation of an image from the Old Sun uh, Residential School, the girls eating uh, uh, ca uh, cafeteria. And uh, so that's in the back. And that's actually material culture from Old Sun College, the light itself. So that hangs over the table. The bowl is actually supposed to be, um, oh, no, it is right. That is right in that image. So originally, they got it wrong. They put all red roses and one white rose. And I said, no, it ought to be white roses and one red rose. <laughs> so anyway, that's, the, uh, that's uh, the table itself. And then I believe in the background, you can see the portrait of 68 images. And those are all, I'm sorry, I don't have a uh, better image of that. Um, a little bit there in the background. Uh, that was from 1953, the Old Sun Boys. Uh, and my father is in one of those images. And it was dawning on me as I was looking at the, I have the archive at home, and I was looking through these images. And as I'm looking through them, I'm realizing that these images are our fathers. And I got the great privilege of knowing many of them. Many of them are no longer with us. But I felt it important to bring them into the space not only witnessing, but also um, you know, showing the history of, of, of those schools. This is now turned into a book. A, this is another thing, offshoots of what AA and are, do, are doing. AA is a great lover of books and zines. And so he has uh, most graciously helped me publish a uh, uh, book of these portraits, along with a short, little short essay that I did. 
And uh, he also has the Apology Book itself, which is a great resource in terms of the research that Ben Miller did and he at the Glenbow Museum and further sort of digging into that history. So again, the importance of art in, in being witness, but also in becoming material culture of history, for history. Here we go, another little one there. And then this is AA at the uh, Biennale. He gave the apology there. Uh, it's not over yet. Uh, I brought in a number of um, uh, nation members uh, to witness that particular apology on behalf of our chief and council who uh, gave us their blessing to go forward and receive it. And then there is one more aspect, and we we're supposed to do it this past spring. AA was supposed to return to the nation to deliver it to the people during a powwow and that part of the process that I would sponsor around dance. And then we would give the apology, dance together, and then celebrate afterwards. And so we have yet to do that. Uh, and then most recently, I was in the Biennale of Sydney. And uh, some of my old works were wallpapered at uh, Campbelltown uh, Arts Center, uh, just outside. And oh my goodness, what time is it? Okay, and this is Buffalo Boy Dreams in Four Directions. I did a small installation and a video. Buffalo Boy was dreaming. And so these are all the little dreams with one of the characters, uh, Naked Nappy, shooting his essence at a train. <laughs> Again, that cheekiness. A dingo and Buffalo Boy looking at each other. Someone shooting with a bison from the train. Um, just for those who want to know, uh, Buffalo Boy has now been retired. Buffalo Boy will no longer perform. Uh, his history will only be through the archive. And uh, we'll see, because usually he's been killed off before, then he's come back, and then he's been a ghost, and then he was sleeping. And so I think it's time. It's time. He's, he faded into the sunset. And then my last performance was supposed to be at the Biennale of, uh, of Buffalo Boy, was supposed to be at the Biennale of Sydney. Uh, but due to COVID, everything was shut down very quickly, and I had to cancel a performance that I had with 30-some people. And those people were going to do Buffalo Boy's Last Stand with Tess. And why Last Stand with Tess, or Stand with Tess, is Tess is a dear friend. But she was also an Indigenous educator at the University of New South Wales. Uh, art, uh, Department of Art and Design, and un, without reason, and in a very, very bad way, they let her go after 14 years of work there. And a huge protest by the students that's continuing to this day, and we were going to, at the Biennale, expose the hypocrisy of that particular university, which does not walk its talk, and is actually incredibly disgraceful, and I have no problem saying that publicly. Uh, so. I had a wonderful group of people, 30-some people and elders and everybody, we were going to do a protest at the Biennale, and sadly that didn't happen. But we are still conversing online, and we are creating a video uh, of uh, The Last Stand, and in that video will be the last image of Buffalo Boy uh, doing his last stand. And it was interesting because basically when the Prime Minister told us to get home, we booked new tickets back to Canada and headed back home within two days. The first thing we saw at the airport was this. And I turned to my husband and I said, I think we're a little underdressed. <laughs> Incredibly stressful. I think another aspect of uh, being in Australia at that time is we went down the coast uh, to a friend's uh, community who had burnt in the bushfires and her home in particular, and seeing the devastation and the trauma of those bushfires. Um, uh, they, it hit me to the core. Um, to be in those forests, and not hear the birds, and not hear the insects, and not hear the animals is incredibly sobering. Um, it really brought home the fact of the very troublesome times we are in with climate change. And now I'm here. <laughs> so uh, being invited to take part in, in uh, the water uh, event again was very honoring. And it was so funny because the second I was invited, the first thing I thought about was waterbed. <laughs> I'm a product of the 70s. I had a waterbed. <laughs> and so I just thought to myself. And then, of course, its relationship to Oyona Oko and John Lennon uh, in their bed-ins. And so, of course, those relationships, it all fit right away. So I thought, oh, OK. So waterbed, life, peace. And then, of course, it was like Yoko asked us if we would gift this to somebody. And so I started to think. And I thought, well, who would I gift this to in the spirit of love 
and education and such. And I thought perhaps I would give it to our, our uh, premier, uh, Jason Kenney. And uh, so, you know, really, he can come anytime and pick it up. It's there for him. And uh, so, you know, part of this is looking at, again, the impact that agriculture and the oil industry has on water. It is the greatest polluter of water. We need to find new ways. Water is life. We are water, you know, and without it, uh, we won't go very far. So I'm a huge advocate. And then part of that sort of, you know, bugs me a little bit, you know, in how politicians couch these things. And in particular, this whole idea of the war room and spending $30 million to create a fictitious war. I often think little boys do those kind of things uh, because quite frankly, there is no enemy. The enemy is yourself. And for me to think that, you know, paying or, or contributing public money to fight a fictitious war is absolutely, incredibly, outrageously <laughs> stupid. <laughs> and I have no problem saying that either. And I'm sure and I hope taxpayers feel the same way in this province because it's all meant to go after these people who are against the oil industry. We all know that industry is dying. We all know that there's going to be a transition period for which I'm sure everybody has the patience to move through, but we have to change. We have to change. And I think, you know, for those who don't feel that way, you know, one day when their grandchildren have no water to drink or no land to grow food on, maybe they'll change their minds then. So it's, I feel incredibly passionate about this, passionate about this. And uh, I really wish politicians would actually start waking up to these realizations and do something about it instead of creating these fictional wars. <laughs> anyway, so there. And you know, in the spirit of love and, uh, and fellowship there, that is how I present it. Because I also think too, and I think everybody feels this too, the anger that this raises within us. And I soon realized that I was internalizing all this anger and I've got to, and it only hurts yourself. So I think for me, it's so important to look at these ideas of, of love. And so thank you, Yoko, for reminding me. And so I'm starting to sort of infuse this more, but it's still important to address the issues. And so that moves now to what I'm doing again. I'm back to the bison and starting to work again on, on painting. Uh, this is a four by four uh, bison. It looks like it's another dimension, but I think I took the picture wrong. Or sometimes when you put it into PowerPoint, it all changes it anyway. So this is uh, a new bunch of work called Bison, small r, big E, revolution. So I never in the past ever really put sort of teepees or romanticized images in my paintings. But again, looking at this sort of circular of life and sort of going back, that back to the future. The future is the present. The present is the past, all this sort of stuff. So now I'm going to start embarking on a whole series of painting with the bison, but looking at indigenous futurism and starting to think about things that can be inserted there. This idea of envisioning the future so that it will happen. That's where I am now. And I, I do think that my work with AA, my work with Yoko, and perhaps in getting a little bit older, am I mellowing? I don't know. Am I realizing that there's some things that are beyond my control, that I can't change some people's minds? But what I can do here and now as an artist is be myself, be as generous as I can, and that's a lesson given to me by my people, the Siksika and the Blackfoot. Try to be still as humorous as I can, but also to look in our time in particular in building relationships and building trust with each other. Because if we don't do that, we are all at peril. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. You uh, it's such an honor to have you here tonight and to share this presentation with us. You bet. Uh, to everybody here and everybody online. So I am the Q&A person, but I'm realizing I cannot sanitize read questions. So I'm going to enlist Ryan to help me with that. So online questions will come through here. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring a sanitized mic over to you. Are there any questions? Well, I get ready. The back. <laughs> oh, 
Hi, Adrian. Okay. Um, I'd like to know your um, opinion about Justin Trudeau's um, failure to um, failure to commit his ending the boil water advisories. There's still 61. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you for reminding us about the numbers that they're still incredibly high. Um, it's such a hard thing when it comes to politicians. You know, they all promise so many things and sadly don't deliver. Um, you know, I, it's one of the things that, uh, that, is, that is hard in our time is that when he first got elected, there was a lot of hope. There was a lot of, you know, feelings that, oh, he's going to do something. But then soon you quickly realize that it's the same old, same old. And that's very disillusioning. It doesn't help build trust in institutions, democratic institutions, you know? So I think it's a shame. I think it's a shame that these things haven't been addressed. And it's, it really behooves me with the technologies and with the, what I thought will, was to change things. And we still see that there are boil water advisories in all these communities. It's not right. And so I think he has a lot to atone for, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I also want to say that I think that there are, that, you know, there are things that are going on too that are good, that are helping. But we have to focus on what's not going right too. And we have to remind because, you know, the next headline takes over and we forget. And how many times have we forgotten about this? So yes, do something, you know, figure it out. I have a friend in the community of um, Grassy Narrows, uh, where mercury poisoning is, and he has told me horror stories of what that has done to his community and his own health. And uh, it's heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. And so, again, the preciousness of water, and why is it that not every Canadian has the right to clean water? Every Canadian deserves the right to clean water. So I think we can still say that loudly and say it clearly. And let's hope at some point a politician actually listens and does something dramatic. Let's not just do little things. Attack it like you would attack something uh, that needs to be dealt with in a good way. Thank you for that question. Adrian, we have a question from the Facebook Live, uh, and we'd encourage more questions. Um, does Premier Kenny know that you have gifted him this waterbed? <laughs> well, I understand and believe that uh, Premier Kenny is an art lover. He has often been seen in uh, art galleries and enjoying the works and stuff. So I would hope that he'd actually come here and see his work. And, uh, you know, it's his. <laughs> Maybe somebody has to give him a call and tell him. Okay. I think <laughs> Maybe I should give him a call and tell him. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there's a question here. I'm just going to sanitize the mic and be right with you. With your performance art um, and being Buffalo Bill, how did your community um, receive it? Or what was your, what was the reaction to it? Um, my community, uh, being Siksika, um, they laughed their, gut, they laughed their guts out. <laughs> Again, humor is a big part of it, and they, they, they get what I'm doing in some way. Uh, sometimes they get a little embarrassed by what I do, because <laughs> I'm a little crazy uh, at times. Uh, but uh, we also have a trickster carrier, character called Nappy. And we have many nappy stories. And some of those nappy stories are very irreverent and sometimes sexual. And uh, it's interesting because that is woven within our, 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 the fabric of, our, our, of the people anyway. So for me to do that in this sort of performance genre, um, they, they felt uh, uh, they all, I didn't, had, I've not had a person come to me and, and tell me that, oh my god, what are you doing? Although my father did say at one time, so when are you going to be done with this buffalo boy? <laughs> I think that had to do that, in fact, that my ass was showing out all the time with fishnets. So I think that that was probably a little bit more 
on his, his mind than anything. Um, but also, too, I think one of the other things that's important, and, and also, too, with the um, uh, piercing of the chest, had somebody sort of approach me and said, well, not sacred, and, and that's with, with, with um, uh, Sundance and stuff like that. And I, I make it very clear that the performance I do, it is in with the realm of performance art. I don't have the rights to do those other things and stuff like that. Uh, so I think I often say that, yes, you cannot help. My culture influences me, everything I do. So, that, uh, so you will see elements of, of those kind of things within the work I do. But I also make it very clear that, no, this is in the realm of performance. And what I do in performance is different than what I would do in ceremony or ceremonial sort of uh, work. Thank you very much for your uh, talk tonight. I uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, you referenced in the earlier slides a vision. Uh, could you speak to that vision, circumstances around it, uh, and what exactly happened there? Sure. Uh, visions are interesting things. I think you know we have this sort of idea that it's you know going off into the wilderness, and yes, that's part of it. You can do that too, and go through different ceremony to attain a vision. And in the indigenous way, we have those ceremonies that, that occur, and uh, for which I've actually taken part in a few uh, uh, fasts and, and such. But I also don't discount the waking visions and the day visions that we have. Often I'm, I'm sitting there, and often these ideas pop into my mind, or I all of a sudden see these things, and I don't really know where they're coming from. So I have to trust that they're coming from somewhere. So for me, uh, with the uh, Buffalo Particles painted teepee uh, that I did is that often our, within the Blackfoot um, uh, worldview, um, teepees come from visions and then they're handed through families and, and they're living entities to protect the family and you can tell your story on the, fa on the teepee and such. So for me, I had this sort of vision of, of two teepees actually, so I still have to have another one that sort of go together, and we've had those teepees before, and they create a much larger teepee. But it sort of creates this sort of, very actually, interestingly enough, uh, the infinity sign, or also uh, the Métis uh, sign as well. So it's interesting that I thought about that. But the outsert is all um, uh, the bison sort of stamp uh, that completely fill, and then the, uh, the, the tenants of the teepee, of the geometric design of the of the mountain state, but they get higher and higher, so it creates this spinning motion, if you look at it from the top. And so I've yet to do the other one, and I'm still trying to get teepee poles. <laughs> My old teepee poles were, were, were no longer useful, so I still have to get a bunch of new teepee poles, and I, I'll get that one back up, and then hopefully get the other one, and at some point combine them. So uh, I have a bit of cultural protocol to go through that. It actually has stood with the, uh, the, its ancestors uh, at one uh, nation days a few years back. Uh, so it has stood with the other Blackfoot teepees, for which I was very honored and proud of. But I do realize that sometimes I jump the gun a little bit in these things, and I need to back up a little bit and go through the proper protocol in order to, to present that in another way to the community. So things you learn uh, as you move along through life. Adrian, another question online. Um, will there be a new performance, or I believe they mean a new character, to come after the departure of Buffalo Boy? <laughs> well, I, I've tried. I, actually, I, I have Naked Nappy, uh, which is a crazy character with a huge phallus. <laughs> Again, to talk about misogyny and all that sort of things. And, um, uh, but I'm not sure what, where that one's going. Uh, I've tried a little bit. I think that's one of the things with performance and performance art. It is. It can be very physically, um, well, physically taxing, uh, endurance and such like that. I'm getting older. Uh, I don't know if I have the same stamina to do a lot of performances that I've done in the past. So that is shifting well, or, or shifting at this time in my life. Uh, it's kind of you get to a point for where you start to assess everything and you start to think about what you've done, where it's gone, uh, and what to do now. And so I'm not discounting that there won't be another character into the future. Something may come up. Uh, but for now, I'm actually just deciding to sort of focus on um, uh, painting and uh, public projects. Uh, I have actually, on International Avenue soon, an installation going in called Kawapoma Cakes, Animals That Roam the Plain or Prairies. And it is steel cutout animals in this planter 
and the Blackfoot names for them. And then you can go online and learn how to say those Blackfoot names. So uh, that's coming up. And my team, Team Stimson, was shortlisted, or, or yeah, shortlisted with uh, four other teams uh, to compete uh, for uh, the National Monument to Canada's mission in Afghanistan, uh, which will uh, be in Ottawa. So in May, we present that to the jury. And if we are successful, uh, we will be creating the National Monument to Canada's mission in Afghanistan. So we'll see what happens there. Hey, Adrian, I have a question for you, too. You um, one of the things about in Yoko Ono's uh, practice was that she came to painting through performance, uh, you know, pieces like, uh, you know, painting to hammer a nail, for example. I'm wondering how you see, you have all these different practices. How do they, what's, where's that uh, confluence between painting and performance for you? Hmm. Well, I've often stated that I see everything through a painter's eyes. Uh, the painting is my first love and discipline. So I often construct things first as a painting in my mind, and then be it uh, installation, sculpture, performance, uh, it sort of comes out of that. Uh, I, it's interesting in our, in our time now, I really believe interdisciplinary or being an interdisciplinary artist is really a reaction to our times. Being that in order to make a living, artists really have to sort of be very flexible in their practice. So it really came nat naturally to take on these other disciplines to find the right media to, to tell the story. And uh, so, but I also think that there also comes a time when it all comes back together, goes out, comes back. Uh, there are certain aspects of my practices, practice that I know that I won't do anymore. I just, it's, it's no longer relevant to what I'm thinking. Uh, so kind of like the big nets cast, and then you sort of bring it back in. And so we'll see where, see where we end up. Questions in the room? I was wondering who won your Canadian Idol No More. <laughs> <laughs> I knew somebody was going to ask me that. Well, at the end of that, it was actually, interestingly enough, it was election year, and Stephen Harper won. <laughs> and we said, and the sentencing will be on election day, blah, 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 and he lost. <laughs> so I think we had a lot to do with that. Any other questions in the room? One more over, over here. Oh, hi again, Adrian. Um, I'm just curious to know if you've ever uh, seen this uh, 1984 short film called Herald of Orange, previously banned in Canada. And are you familiar with the term uh, coined by Gerald Wisner, socio-acupuncture. It's a term uh, to describe uh, breaching difficult topics through the use of humor. You know, I've, I've read a lot of uh, Gerald in the, in the years, but I forgot about that. Thank you for reminding me. Yes, I love that. I love that idea, absolutely. And I don't think I've seen that field. Does it have to do with Agent Orange? Harold of Orange. Uh, no, it's, he, Harold of Orange is a trickster. Oh, okay, okay. No, I haven't seen that. I'll have to uh, look for that. It sounds lovely. There's so much out there. That's the the wonderful thing is that when you think you know, you've seen seen it all. There's a lot more. <laughs> Are there any other final questions for Adrian in the room? One back here. Hi, Adrian. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Um, have you found that with COVID, um, it's easier for you to get into your creative mind, or are you finding it difficult to be isolated? Such a uh, great and important question. I have to say that it's been a really difficult time. 
You know, you think when you have a lot of time, you can do a lot of work. Something happens. In particular, I have to say that when the lockdown happened and then all you know, the drama of coming back home from, 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 from Sydney, but I can also imagine everyone who suddenly found themselves isolated, that something else happens. Um, and I'm not quite sure what that is. I, I think with a lot of artists, um, I lost all my gigs this year, all of them. And then suddenly the panic comes in. It's like, OK, how am I going to make a living? You know, it's, it, it becomes very stressful. And that becomes more stressful in the sense of what do we do uh, to put food on our table? So that becomes more relevant. You know, luckily, and, and this is to the credit of the government, we had a good safety net for people for this time. And we know that's kind of over now. We don't know what's next. So I'm sure that's pretty stressful for people. But I found for myself that I don't know all of a sudden I became a real procrastinator. <laughs> I was like, oh, I got to get this done. I got to get this done. And then a month later, why haven't I got it done? And time, interestingly enough, I actually one time in my practice really preached this idea of no time, that we should live in a, in a time with no time. <laughs> and be careful what you ask for, <laughs> because all of a sudden, it's weird as we live in this sort of flat world of our screens and, and how the energies and stuff like that, that time becomes suspended. And you just really don't see time passing in the same way. And so I'm all of a sudden now, I've got several deadlines. Hello, all the people that I owe stuff to. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> and, but you know, it's like, it's like it just all of a sudden you just, I don't know, I, I think something happens that, that that's sort of stops our creati creativity. I know that's, also, that's not true for everyone, because I know all, some people have just exploded with their work, too. So it really depends, I, I think, on your situation. You know, and I live in the country, and I'm kind of isolated anyway. So, and then, but I actually decided to focus on food security. And I'm a real avid guy. I love gardening. I take care of bees. And this year, we added chickens. <laughs> so, so now, we got our first eggs a couple weeks ago. I'm so excited about that. So for me, I, that's another, uh, not an anxiety, but a worry about this idea of food security um, that we need to all be very uh, aware of. Um, so my energies were directed in a different way because of the urgency of these, some of these issues. But I also have to say that I have found it incredibly difficult to create. Um, but this is where the discipline, the artistic discipline comes into play, is that you get a center yourself, and then you do it. You start doing it. Because I have, I have obligations I've created for myself and things I want to do. So I'm getting at it and getting back at it. And you know, I guess like everyone, it's, it's just a new, time, new way of situating yourself in the world. And it, and it takes time. We're only human beings. It takes the time for us to figure it out. And in figuring it out, we will create new ways of doing things and new ways of creating. For me, it's like, how do you take performance and put it on video? It's not the same. <laughs> it's not the same to what anybody says. But maybe it can be. So I'm looking at that right now and thinking, trying to figure out how to do that. So to all my fellow artists, you know, hang in there. It's tough. It's a tough time. Big breaths. Adrian, there's one more question online. And then maybe if there's one more in the room after that. And then, of course, the gallery is open until 9 o'clock. And so if folks want to see the, see the exhibition, uh, the question online is, have you had opportunities to mentor young artists? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this past summer, um, in, in the midst of all COVID and with all sorts of protocols, and through the generosity of the uh, of City of Calgary and uh, their Indigenous programming, uh, we uh, were able to bring, um, at this case, four artists, one who's in the audience today, uh, to uh, come and hang out and learn about the land, learn about uh, uh, such, and basically connecting Calgary to Siksika and artists and mentoring artists. So that is one opportunity I had recently, which was really lovely. And um, I make it a part of my practice that when the opportunity arises uh, to mentor and to make myself available uh, to artists uh, to have discussions. So I think mentorship is a huge and important part of being. Thank you. Are there any final, one, one final question in the room? Not seeing any 
Adrian, thank you so much for Great. being here this evening. Thank and, you. Um, and uh, thanks, everybody, for coming, especially under strange circumstances. Yes, and, thank uh, you. Thank and, you. And, and thank you to everybody who joined us in our first webcast. Um, appreciate everyone's time. And um, once again, a round of applause for Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, hang on. And one more thing. I just want to thank you all uh, from Contemporary Calgary again. Before I arrived, they handed me this wonderful bag. And in it were uh, a lovely chew bones, uh, a little bowl, and stuff for my new puppy, Jet and Bongo. So thank you. Your kindness is amazing. <laughs>